Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for making the time to be with us tonight and join us, joining us for our second um, address uh, as part of the Sazel Moon Cohen Center's Lawyers as Changemakers series. Uh, this is our second event. We've already had one, and then hopefully, if you've got the time, we look forward to seeing you on the 27th of July. I think that's correct, right? Um, when the Attorney General is going to also come and talk on this uh, as part of this series on the life and the contribution of Sazelman. Before I sort of jump in and introduce the speaker today, I would like to, of course, start with acknowledgement of country <clears throat> and acknowledge the traditional owners on the lands in which you and I meet today, the Wurundjeri people um, of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Perhaps this is a very nice and comfortable room to make these comments about acknowledgement of country. And maybe it's also appropriate to do so because we are all considering our own answers to the call for the voice. For those of us who have always thought of home, acknowledgement of country is more than a mere formality. Or at least it should be more than a formality. It can act as a reminder that our ongoing business of nation building remains unresolved, and that questions of justice and history and reconciliation remain unanswered, and that perhaps, as I alluded to, we all have a role to play in moving this country towards a version of itself that it's more reconciled and provide equal justice to all. So as you move around your own circles and you have conversations about the voice, I hope you do your part to persuade people to move this country towards a more reconciled version of itself. Now, if you're just wondering as well, who is this tall six foot woman at the door? And well, really, um, I hope you're not. But if you are, my name is Nyaro Nyon, and if I've not met you before, I'm the director of Sazelman Cohen Center. Um, the center focus is around issues of law and cultural diversity. We work to develop programs for the legal sector to understand better the needs of the communities, like I come from, but other communities as well but also to work with communities themselves um, to design programs so that they are better prepared to act as legal citizens in new countries. Today, however, I want to introduce someone that I'm quite proud to know, Ike Nkoli. The biography of Ike is one that I'll get to and list some of his achievement, but I just wanted to mention something that is quite personal. Um, Ike has always been, to some of us who started off as lawyers, a quiet inspiration. To have known that there were lawyers like him as partners in law firm really disrupt the idea that you could not be all you want to be. So I want to start by personally thanking you for the inspiration that I think you've given many of us as we started off in a landscape that can be very looking for the right white. white. Um, but more formally, um, Ike is a senior practice leader in the public litigation team at the Melbourne Office of Status and Gordon. It's been, he's been working there for over 20 years in the, public safe, in the area of public safety claims, negligence claims and product liability claims. He has been named in the Doral Guides as a leading public liability compensation lawyer. That award he got in both 2019, 2020, and 2021, and also in 2022. He's also a member of the Law Institute of Victoria, a former board member of AIMS Australia, and a co-founder and board member in Incubate Foundation, an organization set up to mentor and create employment pathways for African Australian youth. He's also a co-founder and board member of something even more fun, African Music and Cultural Festival. So if you have the time, you should also seek it out and have a dance. I'd like to invite Ike to address us on this second series on his own journey in the legal profession and perhaps some comments on the notion of justice. Thank you so much for making the time to join us. Thank you so much, Nadal. And... Um, I must say that I, you, what you said was very touching, but uh, you inspire me uh, like no other uh, because of the work that you do uh, for the community, 
and this is despite everything that is thrown at you, you always uh, come across as someone who is highly intelligent and you really are able to express the issues that affect the community in a way that most people don't. So um, you are an inspiration as well. Um, now, before I start, I want to start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. I also acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. And I feel very privileged to be part of the Lawyers as Changemaker series and to be included with very distinguished speakers, including William Lai OM Casey, who was the opening speaker of the series, and the Honourable Attorney General Mark Dreyfus MP Casey, who will be the final speaker of the series next month. And I also want to especially thank Nyadon Yuan OA, Director of the Zell Zellman Cohen Centre, for the invitation and her team for making all of this possible. And I also want to thank all of you for taking the time out to attend tonight. I greatly admire the work of the Centre and its focus on improving access to justice, enhancing legal capability, and addressing social and economic disadvantage. I'm inspired by the uh, commitment to social justice and equality and the development of fair and effective legal systems that support the needs of individuals and communities, particularly those who face barriers to accessing justice. And it's something that uh, the firm that I've been at for nearly 30 years uh, aspires to do as well. So our values are aligned. I'm also inspired by the legacy of Sir Zelman Cohen, who coincidentally has a direct connection with my dad, which I will discuss later. I will share a photo that represents a seminal moment in my career. And that is a photo of me in 1994. And yes, I am older than what a lot of you think. <laughs> uh, I'm with Rex Dargi, who is a landowner from the Octeti region in Papua New Guinea. And we have just lodged a writ and statement of claim in the Supreme Court of Victoria. And it is on behalf of 40,000 people that were affected by the acts of the largest industrial company in Australia. And that action was the largest class action in Australia of its time. Now, before I discuss my journey to the steps of the Supreme Court and beyond, I want to talk about an experience that I had when I attended the first Changemaker series talk. So I was out in the courtyard and we were having nibblies and I had uh, the opportunity to meet two law graduates of this university. Uh, one of them had just completed their masters and I revealed that I would be the next speaker and they asked me what I was going to talk about and I said I'll talk about my background and my journey not wanting to give too much away and the person that had just completed her masters said to me I don't normally talk about my background I, I shy away from talking about my background and the person that was with her echoed a very similar sentiment. And the reasons they both gave were around the fear of being judged negatively and not being accepted. And that saddened me a bit because we all have a story to tell. Our backgrounds are instrumental in explaining our story and how each of us arrived at where we are today. What makes talking about our background special is that it is our unique individual story that only we can tell. 
So on that note, I will talk about my background, including my childhood and parental influence. I will share some career highlights and disappointment along the way and how I came to be standing on the steps of the Supreme Court of Victoria in one of, the, in one of Australia's largest class actions. I will discuss aspects of my career post Octedi, including some interests that I have outside of work. And I believe that there will be a one minute Q&A session at the end, uh, maybe 10 minutes. Um, now, my childhood and early life. Uh, my journey in life started with my parents who met in England coming to Melbourne in 1964. After working as a lawyer in the public service, uh, for a number of years, Dad was granted a Commonwealth scholarship to study for a PhD in constitutional law at Melbourne University, uh, which also happens to be my alma mater. And guess who one of my dad's supervisors were? None other than Sir Zelman Cohen, who was the Dean of the Law Faculty at Melbourne University at the time and was an expert in constitutional law. And the support and mentoring that my dad received from both Sir Zelman Cohen and Professor Colin Howard went a long way in ensuring that he completed his PhD. And I will read you a part of the preface to my dad's PhD, acknowledging the support he received and the impact that it had on him. So dad writes in 1973, to my supervisors. Firstly, Professor Zelman Cohen, formerly Dean of the Law of Dean of Law at the University of Melbourne and now Vice Chancellor of the University of Queensland, and then Professor Colin Howard, Hearn Professor of Law at the University of Melbourne. I wish to acknowledge my sincere thanks. Their depth of learning was an inspiration to me for their guidance, very valuable assistance in all sorts of ways and encouragement at all times, but particularly during the trying times, when owing to the pressures to which the Nigerian Civil War subjected me, I was often tempted to discontinue this effort. I am deeply grateful. So, as you can see, Dad really appreciated the support and guidance he received from both of them, and he held both Professor Howard and Sir Zelman Cohen in very high esteem. Having completed his law degree in England at the University of Hull, Dad came to Australia with Mum and my eldest sister in 1964. As fate would have it, this was during the White Australia policy a policy that started in 1901 and finally ended in 1973, where non-European immigration was banned and special preference was given to British migrants. During his time in Australia, in the mid to late 1960s, Dad became quite despondent over the treatment of First Nations peoples, including their forced, the forced removal of children from families and dispossession of their land. His sense of despair was compounded when he completed his PhD and unlike his peers who were offered pathways to lectureships, he was offered a job as a tutor with no career pathway. With four kids under the age of four, we couldn't survive on a tutor's salary, so Dad had to look for other opportunities elsewhere, and he was offered a job as a foundation law lecturer at the University of Papua New Guinea, which was Papua New Guinea's only, well, first university and only university at the time. This was before PNG gained independence from Australia in 1975, so my siblings and I left Australia with my parents when I was six months old. Now, Dad's experience in the mid to late 1960s was both positive and negative. Positive in that he was able to fulfill the requirements 
necessary to obtain a PhD in law from Melbourne University. He was also granted refugee status due to the Nigerian Civil War. And during that time, he met some really kind-hearted people who became lifelong family friends. The negative aspect to his stay was the white Australia policy that existed at the time, which meant he didn't have the same opportunities as his peers of British or European heritage. This negative experience, coupled with the treatment of the First Nations people, had an impact on him and strengthened his already strong desire for social justice. He brought that passion and desire for social justice to his role as a law lecturer at the University of Papua New Guinea and in private practice. As a senior law lecturer at the university, Dad went on to teach and mentor some of PNG's future leaders, including prime ministers and judges of the National and Supreme Courts of Papua New Guinea. Pre-independence, Dad represented the Matanguan Association of East New Britain Province in their bid for self-determination from Australia. After leaving the University of PNG, Dad set up a private law practice, which he ran for over 30 years. In his private practice, he represented a range of clients, including those who were subjected to unfair or unjust practices by government, such as compulsory acquisition of their land without fair compensation, or against insurance companies who were seeking to underpay road victims. Dad was also interested in giving back to the community and was involved in the PNG Red Cross in the early years. He would often represent the organization at international conferences, and I have a strong recollection of him bringing us back T-shirts from cities around the world where these conferences were held. Dad was also the founding president of the Pan-African Association of Papua New Guinea. I can certainly say my dad's passion for social justice and community work rubbed off on me. Now to my childhood and early education. During the years my parents were in PNG, I not only lived in Papua New Guinea, but I also had the opportunity to live in Nigeria from the ages of 11 to 19. I call it an opportunity now, but back then, at aged 11, it was a nightmare. I'm sure we've all heard of the saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That certainly applies to life in Nigeria, especially in boarding school, where you had to, there was no, in, in the boarding school that I went to, there was no running water. So you had to fetch water with a bucket on your head and if you didn't balance the bucket well enough you'd get back to the dormitory and there'd be hardly nothing in the bucket to have a shower with and so whilst living in Nigeria was a baptism of fire it taught my siblings and I resilience and the value of hard work and this continues to carry us and continues to carry me through the challenges that life has to offer Dad sent all his kids to Nigeria because he wanted us to experience and understand our culture and heritage and to have and to instill a sense of pride in our identity. Living in Nigeria and Papua New Guinea made me realize that there were quite a few similarities between both countries. They were both former colonies, with the colonizers being of British heritage. I describe it that way because PNG was administered as a territory of Australia until 1975. Both countries are very linguistically diverse, Nigeria with over 500 languages and PNG with over 800 languages. They both have vast natural resources, Nigeria with predominantly oil and gas and PNG with predominantly gold, copper and gas. It was living in Papua New Guinea and Nigeria that made me realize firsthand the blatant exploitation of these natural resources 
by multinational corporations who showed a complete disregard for the environment and the livelihood of the landowners and people who live in the areas where these resources are located. An issue that I would write about in one of my electives at law school, which I will discuss later. After living in Nigeria for eight years and returning to Papua New Guinea, I completed the International Baccalaureate at Port Moresby International High School, otherwise known as POM High. I completed year 12 and the first year of a law degree in Papua New Guinea. I then applied to several Australian universities and was accepted by all of them, but chose Melbourne University for several re reasons, including the fact that dad attended the university and thought it was the best university in Australia, uh, the fact that I was born in Melbourne, and I had a sister who was at university in Ballarat at the time. In the early 90s, there were very few people of colour and even fewer people of African heritage studying law at Melbourne Uni. And when I think about this, I reflect on my dad's experience being in Melbourne in the mid-1960s during the white Australia policy. Now, considering I didn't go to high school in Australia and knew no one at Melbourne Uni when I started, what helped me transition to the university life in Melbourne was meeting a student in one of my lectures who was carrying a University of Lagos bag. Now, for those who don't know, Lagos is the commercial center and former, former capital of Nigeria. So you can imagine my excitement to see someone in my lecture carrying a University of Lagos bag. So not knowing anybody at all, I plucked up the courage and asked him where he got his bag from. He explained that he had lived in Nigeria as a, on a rotary exchange. And so the boy from Mafra in Gippsland, country Victoria, and the boy with Nigerian heritage who had just arrived from PNG became the best of friends. And it was through him that I met and became friends with other students who made my journey and experience at Melbourne Uni an enjoyable one. It wasn't all smooth sailing, though. I failed constitutional law. As all subjects, the area of law that Dad had received a PhD in, I failed. So that was a very hard pill to swallow. And due to the expectations I placed on myself and that I thought were placed on me, I suffered a bout of depression because I honestly thought my career in law was over. And I'm not sure why, but I did. However, my, de my depression quickly disappeared when I had the opportunity to reset the exam and passed. While I was at Melbourne Uni, my parents and younger brother were still living in Port Moresby, so I was still engaged with what was happening in Papua New Guinea from a political and social standpoint. One major event at the time was the Bougainville conflict, where landowners on the island of Bougainville had forcibly shut down the mine due to the environmental damage and river pollution that was being caused by an Australian-owned local mining company. It, this company was depositing mine waste directly into the river system. Now, similar environmental damage and river pollution was occurring at the Octedi mine in the western province of Papua New Guinea. Now, having seen the environmental damage caused by oil extraction in the Delta region of Nigeria and what was happening in PNG, it left me feeling quite upset about the lack of accountability of these multinational corporations who would not dare behave in the same way in their countries of origin. As fate would have it, while studying law, I chose environmental and natural resources law as one of my elective subjects. A major part of the ass assessment for the subject was writing a 10 or 20,000 word essay 
on environmental protection and the law. I chose Papua New Guinea as a case study, focusing on the environmental impact of mining in Papua New Guinea and looking at the two mining operations, Bougainville Copper Mine on the island of Bougainville and the Octeti Gold Mine in the western province of Papua New Guinea. Both the, of the local companies operating these mines had Australian parent companies, and they were responsible for dispo disposing mine waste and chemicals directly into the river systems that sustain the lives of thousands of people living close to the mine and downstream, destroying the environment and their way of life. In the case of the Bougainville mine, the, the landowners forcibly shut down the mine in 1989 and a long civil war with the PNG government ensued, and it lasted for about 10 years. The mine still remains closed today. After completing my law degree, I decided to take the following year off and to do my articles, uh, or the Leo Cusson, uh, the year after. So I went off, I sent off my resume to a list of firms not really expecting a quick response but to my receipt but to my uh, surprise I received a call the following day and the call was from a executive assistant to one of the partners at Slater and Gordon and she asked me if I was available to come in for an interview the next day and in the same call she asked me if I would be prepared to go to Papua New Guinea at short notice. Now, I thought this was extremely odd, given that I hadn't been interviewed and I hadn't even been offered a job. Uh, little did I know what was in store. So I attended the interview and there were three partners and it became apparent that Slater and Gordon was looking at launching a class action against the largest industrial company in Australia for environmental damage in Papua New Guinea. And when I was told this, I was, it was a quite a, an emotional time because he was a law firm that had less than a hundred lawyers at the time. And they were willing to represent 40,000 landowners or 40,000 people in a different country who had no means of paying any money in legal fees. And they were willing to represent them against the largest and most powerful industrial company in Australia who had billions at their disposal. And so... I was obviously uh, quite excited about it, and I told them that the partners that I had written a paper on the very issue. So I was hired immediately, and my plans to take a year off never eventuated. Um, needless to say, I'm still waiting to take that year off. Now, a few months after commencing my articles, a written statement of claim was issued in the Supreme Court of Victoria. And that photo there is the landowner Rex Dargi celebrating the fact that we've just lodged the Supreme Court writ against the largest industrial company in Australia. Now, I want to talk about um, social justice and personal injury. And, and before, I, before I do that, I actually want to talk about the outcome because um, we managed to uh, settle the case against BHP um, for about $500 million. It was the largest settlement of its time and the settlement went to uh, dredging the river. It also went to building a pipeline and it went to setting up a trust fund 
uh, for business development and social infrastructure for the affected areas. And uh, after the settlement, my brother and I uh, went for a visit to Papua New Guinea. Uh, my brother uh, works in PNG from time to time. And we stayed at the Hilton Hotel in Papua New Guinea. Uh, sorry, in Port Moresby. And uh, I discovered by just looking up at the Hilton sign that the Hilton Hotel was actually owned by the Octeti landowners who had used some of the funds from the settlement to buy the Hilton Hotel. So it was uh, a pretty special moment to see the impact of the litigation and what it had uh, on those affected. Um, now, I want to talk about social justice and personal injury. Um, since the Octeti case, I moved on to do, uh, in the area that I am now, to do to work on public liability law cases. And that is where I feel real change is made. I now act for individuals who have suffered personal injury and we act against insurance companies um, and basically powerful companies that have uh, injured people or uh, have basically made um, areas not safe. And I want to um, talk about uh, social justice in a personal injury context. Um, in any personal injury claim, social justice is a crucial consideration because these cases often involve unequal power dynamics, often powerful and wealthy insurance companies against individuals struggling to make ends meet. And systemic biases can disadvantage certain groups of people. For example, people from marginalized communities may face greater barriers to accessing legal representation and receiving fair compensation for their injuries. And it's essential to have a lawyer who is committed to social justice and understands the unique challenges facing clients from diverse backgrounds. And this involves working to ensure that each claim is evaluated fairly and without bias. And there are a number of cases that I've been involved in where I think my life experience has led to a different outcome. And um, there's obviously the case of Ian Chol, which you well, many people might have heard about, but just to remind you, and it was one of the most traumatic cases and impactful cases that I've dealt with because one was that it involved a four-year-old girl who was mauled to death by a pit bull dog in front of her mother. And what had happened was her mother had had some guests who had uh, come to visit and she'd walked them to the car to go and say goodbye. And while that was happening, the neighbor across the street happened to be returning home. And as he opened the gate, the pit bull dog that was on the loose ran out of the gate and proceeded to run towards um Ian's mother. They saw the dog coming, so they quickly ran back into the house. But the dog chased them and ran into the house with them. And there was Ian in the living room, just playing as four-year-olds do. And this dog literally attacked her. And the nature of pit bull dogs is that when they grab onto you, 
they don't release. And despite what was tried, they didn't release. Um, they couldn't get the dog off. And I acted for Ian's mum in the case. And I was struck by just how calm she was for what she had seen and what she had been through. Um, and, you know, I, I ran a marathon to raise money for her because, um, you know, compensation claims take a long time. You know, they can take two to three years. And so we were able to raise about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars for her and it was really just to be able to tide her over and to um, support her. Um, this case ended up changing the law in Victoria. As a result of what happened, legislation was enacted to make it a criminal offence for dog owners whose dogs injure or kill people, they now uh, face jail sentences. Before this case, all they would get was a fine. Um, as a result of the case, the law changed in Victoria such that dog owners are now uh, criminally liable and fail and face jail sentences. Um, and so the ultimate goal of social justice in personal injury claims is to ensure that all individuals who have access, that all individuals have access to resources and support that they need to recover from their injuries and to move forward with their lives. And this requires a commitment to fairness, equality, and compassion throughout the legal process. And based on my own experience, I bring my life experience to the practice of law. And I thoroughly understand the importance of it, addressing systemic injustices and advocating very, very strongly for my clients, especially my clients that are marginalized. Now, it's also important that outside of work that you have other interests. And uh, these interests are crucial because they can be a circuit breaker between your day job and uh, what you do outside. Until recently, I was involved in three not-for-profits, two of which I co-founded. Uh, my wife, who's sitting there with my sister-in-law and my brother, um, co-founded the Incubate Foundation, a mentoring organization for young African Australians. And after six years of being on the board, we handed the organization over to young people to empower them to continue to make a positive impact. I also co-founded the African Music and Cultural Festival, as Nadal pointed out, which is an annual celebration of African music, food and culture, and it's held at the Vic Market, Australian Immigration Museum and Federation Square each year. And this year we will be celebrating our 10th year anniversary. Additionally, I've served on the board of AIMS, and that's where I met Kathy Lester. Um, and AIMS is the largest provider of settlement services for adult migrants and uh, persons granted refugee status. Engaging in these activities allows me to contribute to causes that are meaningful to me and that also make a difference outside of work. And I think it's very important for lawyers and everyone to find balance and pursue interests that bring fulfillment and allow them to connect with others uh, or with the communities in which they live. Now, I want to conclude by saying that growing up in PNG and Nigeria, I had no idea of the path that I would follow or the career that I would have. And when I finished university, I wasn't really sure of what the future held. And some of you who are starting out or changing careers may have the same uncertainty about what is next. And in deciding what is next, what I will say is that you should be true to yourself. 
and find out what ignites your passion, even if it's unrelated to the practice of law. And whatever you do, it will take persistence in the face of obstacles. I often get asked how I've remained in the same job with the same firm for as long as I have. Firstly, uh, well, there are three things that have sustained me during my career. The first is an unwavering belief in the work that my team and I do and the profound difference that we make in people's lives each and every day. And it's a privilege that I don't take for granted. The second thing is that there are bonds that you form with your work colleagues. When you've worked with people for 20 plus years, you form bonds, you form special relationships. Um, you know, you share your triumphs and you share your losses uh, and you share many of your personal and special milestones. I've got colleagues who uh, have children when I started were four years old. They're now lawyers working in the firm or gone to the bar. So I've seen their transition. And so it's having people uh, that you connect with. It's also having people outside that you can mentor, that, that mentor you or you can get advice from. The third thing, and it's something that is obviously dear to everyone, and that's family. Um, my family, my wife, Zioni, our daughter, Adora, they anchor and remind me of the importance of having balance because I do work a lot. And um, it is the nature of being in litigation is that there are deadlines and, you know, you just got to do the, do the work. But it's my family, it's my extended family, my brother, my sister-in-law. They are the source of reinvigoration and they are what enable me to face the challenges each day bring. So final words. Trust in your journey, whatever it is. Pursue your passions and surround yourself with people that uplift you. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that, uh, for that speech. I think it really embodies what you meant when you started with the comment about we all have a story to tell. And I feel as though we've not only got to heard your story, but also your father's story. Um, and it must be both amazing and frightening to have been here during the white Australian policy, pursuing constitutional law. Um, there's something for me at least deeply inspiring about that because I think it is such a useful tool for young people, not just of African background, but of diverse background to realize there's not one way of being an African Australian lawyer and that the history goes back, you know, it's not recent. So personally, I don't know why we don't have a scholarship name after your dad uh, as a way of absolutely raising awareness about these histories um, that exist and these stories that we don't get to, to tell. So thank you so much. Can we again just have a round of applause for Ike and for Ike's dad and also for Ike's mom. <laughs> um, it's now time for questions. I think we've got 10 minutes for questions. Exactly. So I might end up taking one. Maybe I'll take two questions at the same time. And then we'll let Ike answer them. Uh, but just because I'm standing here, I might start with the first question. Well, you guys think about what questions you want to ask. Um, and I think the, one of the reasons I, I wanted to do this series was because I thought a missing link in the way we talk about law is the importance of justice. You know, I think we at least in my experiences, there are aspects of law that get very elevated 
um, as the epitome of success in the, in in law school, but also in the legal sector itself. But to some of us, I think uh, justice is really the kind of the spirit of the law, the thing that makes it work. And it's interesting to see that theme in your own father's pursuits, but also in the choices um, you've made in the legal career you've pursued. So my um, question um, is, you know, how can we encourage young people now who are so intelligent and so aware to think more broadly about the law, but to also dedicate themselves to a concept of justice, whether it's through advocacy in other form or in the legal space they take, and to take some of them away from the commercial space. That's just make it. Thanks, Nyodo. Geez, that's a difficult one. Um, yeah, look, I, I think proximity, proximity is key because when what what motivated me uh and what made me naturally gravitate towards social justice was experiencing it seeing seeing how things were happening and thinking this is not right and um it's hard but and look, the internet has changed everything for us because um, young people often get influenced by, you know, what they see and there's this desire to want whatever that they see on social media, which is not necessarily real or it's it's exaggerated. Um, but I think it's just... Uh, education, exposure, um, taking the time to share experiences with young people and getting them to realize how they can make a difference. Like, I could not imagine myself working for an insurance company or, you know, doing trying to um do mergers and acquisition it's just not something that in any way interests me and you know and i think look part of it as you heard in my talk has been the influence of my dad um and you know as a young boy you know you'd hear my dad would tell these stories and you think that they're not impacting you, but they do because suddenly you realize that, you know what, I do share those same values. Um, so it's about exposure and getting them to experience people around them that can show them the value of it. I wasn't cutting you off. I realized I went and sat down when I needed to take two more questions. So anybody else has a question? Yes. We'll just take the question both at the same time and I'll let Thank you. I am outsider. I'm not a lawyer. I'm a public health practitioner from the U.S. So I'm so I'm so happy to be here, Nyado, for inviting me. But your story is so inspirational. Twenty-two years ago, I was separated with them. They came to the Australian, and I went to the U.S. But my general question is: I'm into nonprofit also. Is the social justice aspect, particularly with the new arrival, I don't know how it is here in the in the Australia, but there's challenges when certain communities particularly come here, they're new, and they feel like they're isolated, then there's crime, and then the whole community may be subjected to like, they're the bad people. Um, how do you advocate in a certain level that to say it, it's not just a community, it is a certain behaviors or influence as you were talking about. So how do you advocate for that? Uh, I'm not going to, this is my brother, he's a community leader, but people who are community leaders with background of Africa, what I observe in the U.S. is they are isolated. They're not connected to the system and they're the victim and their story is not heard. So can you elaborate how do a, a community could be able to do uh, social justice to be heard right. 
I'll take a second question and then we'll just let Ike answer, yeah? Yes, thanks. Ike, I just wanted to know whether you remembered that occasion and if you can remember it, how it felt. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, there's something about that picture that reminds me a little bit of John Lewis, you know, getting into good trouble, I think. Like that. Um, yes, glad I can answer those questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, geez, Nadal, I reckon you are, you are better suited to answer the first question. Um, look, in terms of, to your, que to, your, to your question and the comments, yes, a lot of what you've been experiencing in America has happened here, where uh, groups of Africans were basically labeled you know, negatively and African gangs and all that sort of thing. So that has happened. In terms of how you advocate, and, and I referred to how inspiring your doll is, having more people out there talking about the positive things, the positive contribution that we as a group are doing in society. It's just continually breaking down the stereotype, the narrative, you know. So, you know, it's it, it takes everyone to want to be involved, to talk about what's positive. What was so interesting, um, when um, the, our current opposition leader um, said that nobody wanted to go out to dinner because there were African gangs, right? And it caused outrage in Melbourne. And all over social media, there were just all these people going out to dinner, you know, and it was a way of just addressing the nonsense. And so it is about community coming together and seeking to, you know, change the narrative. Okay. Um, Emrys, what was I thinking? Um, well, can I say there were about 300 cameras. Oh. There were just cameras everywhere. And um, I, as you can see on my face, um, I was very, very proud. I, I was just extremely proud. And, yeah, I couldn't believe that I was part of this historic case. It was it was the only news in town for weeks. And um, I was just more especially grateful that we could, well, that my firm was willing to take on this case on behalf of these landowners in Papua New Guinea. Um, and at very great risk to themselves because BHP threw everything at us. They threw everything at us. They wanted to bankrupt the firm. And um, despite everything, we, we managed to achieve a, a, a good outcome for them. So, yeah, just pride was what I was feeling. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. We now have a gift to present to Ike. Uh, it's not a picture of my face. It, yeah. It's uh, Zelman Cohen. And at the back, it's to, has your name on it, and being part of our first Lawyers is Change to Make a series. We hope to run this series going forward. Um, but thank you so, so much, thank you. personally, for all the inspiration for all the work. Um, and to your dad and your mom as well. Uh, for bringing up somebody who have taken on that fire and continue to change the image for communities today. So thank you, please. Thank you. So that's it um, for the night. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope it was as inspiring for a lot of you Eddie, as it was for me specifically. I feel like I've learned even more about African Australian legal contribution. So thank you so much for all that. Um, hopefully we'll see you again on our uh, last session on the 27th of July with 
the Attorney General. So please invite other people to come as well, um, especially if you can drag some young people along. That would be fantastic. Um, and finally, I would really, really like to thank members of my team who have been working so hard. Um, we've got Hamid at the back. Um, uh, so thank you for all your work, Hamid. Um, Hamid started working with us last year and is um, recently came to Australia as a refugee from Afghanistan. And it's been really wonderful having you in the team. We've got Selkin. Um, she is just the most calmest, generous person you'll ever meet. Uh, thank you so much for all the work. And then the great Tierney, who is a senior manager. Essentially, she does all the work. I take all the credit. And I hope I haven't missed any member of my team that must, that must, that might have left. Uh, Robin would have been the one who got you in and was serving, as well as Eva, who honestly stopped me from flying to Sydney today because I thought I was going to Sydney. Uh, so I've got a wonderful group of people that helps. And also Kath Luster, who was the former director of the Sazelman Cohen Center and always remained um, such a big supporter. Um, thank you all and um, Emrest. Thank you so much. You have always been such a great support. Um, and I know you don't like this at all, being mentioned in public, but Emrest gave me my first job in the law. So if I ever go anywhere, it is literally a risk. Good night, everyone, and thank you so much.